for whatever reason, or you disapprove, or, or it doesn't make sense. Because there are a couple of different things there. Um, if, if a player hears something that doesn't make sense to a new person of authority, generally speaking, um, people are more likely to sort of shut down a little, become a little shy, and, and not question authority. Um, in which case, they're probably less likely to listen to what you've got to say going forwards. Um, but also, I think that it's important for them to understand that you encourage it. Because when situations arise where you're coaching them and they want to say something, instead of shutting down, switching off, and not listening to you, they're far more likely to say, actually, let's, let's start a dialogue. Let's, let's find out why she's telling me to transfer my weight forwards into the shop. I don't understand. And I think it's really important to, to let people know that you welcome that, especially if you're like me and you're a little off the wall. But generally speaking, for anyone, and actually, while doing my research, I came across a thing called psychological safety, um, which, when I read about it, was <coughs> fascinating. But essentially, it means that people feel like they can ask for help without feeling like it's going to be a threat to their dignity. They feel like it's okay to ask, it's okay to question. Um, so I, I do this to tennis players, and I'm going to do it with you all, I would really like it. If there's anything I say that you don't like, please, let's talk about it. Because you know, that's, that's how we're all going to learn, is by discussing these things. So I, that's my, oh, so this is P and Q. We're gonna go through <laughs> the P and the A and Q. The mystery will be unveiled shortly. <laughs> and this is actually an O. It's got importance too. Uh, right, so I'm gonna have to just dance in front of the thing to do this. There. Thrilling. Positivity. Ta-da! Unveiled. So, positivity is an obvious one. We've heard it so many times. We've heard be positive, positive mental attitudes, and really, is, is that the best way forwards? I think that, personally, yes, but there are going to be a lot of coaches out there that might say, oh, if you're just overly positive, and you're not giving good feedback, then that's just pointless. And so I think while I love the word positivity, I'm also going to throw out there the word solutions. I believe that no matter what you're trying to do on a tennis court, you can phrase what you're saying as a solution rather than as what is going wrong. So while it's important to understand what we're fixing, you know, pick a parameter, is your knee bent when it should be, not bent when it should be straight, whatever. We, we've got to understand what we're fixing, and there is a time and a place to say, here's what we're fixing. But going forwards, you can phrase everything after that in a way that gives people an actual solution, something they can fix in their mind that will help them with their problem. Um, and also, if we, as coaches, train people to think in solutions while we're coaching them, they're going to be thinking in solutions during matches. And I know that a lot of the kids sometimes have coaches on court in certain match situations, but in a lot of tennis situations we don't, so it's a bit varied. You still want to train them to think in a way that they can fix their own problems throughout their matches. Um, and honestly, why don't we lead by example with that? Why don't we always focus on the solutions? So, quick show of hands, um, how many of you have heard don't hit it in the net. Oh. <laughs> right. How many of you heard, don't hit it out? <laughs> right. What about, don't double fault? <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you think, don't hit it out, or don't double fault, or don't miss, in your mind, you're thinking about missing and double faulting. If so, we can change all of those things around to be solutions. Say, don't, don't hit it out. Well, what about just maybe hit it a little bit softer? 
hit it over a net. Um, don't hit it in the net wall, hit it over the net. Let's start with our first problem. Hit <laughs> it over that one. Um, so I think there's always a way to turn things around into the solutions opposed to the problems. And I think that that's a very powerful thing. We don't realize how often we say negative things and how it's actually not that difficult to step back and say, what's the solution? Can we think in solutions? So while I was doing the research for this, I found this fantastic study, and it's quite recent too. Um, I think it was from earlier this year, Stanford study. Um, I don't know if it's on the next slide or not, never mind. Uh, I think not. Uh, so, yeah, oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I really, really love this. Uh, there was this Stanford study on these kids that were doing math. The kids that did that liked math, did better in math. Okay, that's fairly logical. But the kids that actually were enjoying a positive attitude towards math, regardless of how good they were, well, they, were, they did some Stanford stuff and wired things into their brain and whatnot. <laughs> and they found that the part of your brain that is associated with memory and learning the activity is increased when you're having a good time. Isn't that huge? So, so what you're saying is by having a positive attitude, my brain works better? I didn't write down the stats, I should have done. <laughs> I, I know they're there, we can look them up. They were, they were fantastic, the actual numbers. Um, and what they came up with, <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, it exists. We'll look it up. Um, what they came up with was that positive mental attitude and IQ were just as important to success in math. I wish someone had told me that in math class. <laughs> I still struggle with mental arithmetic. <laughs> Okay, so let me see what happens on the next one. Oh, yeah, see, there we go. <laughs> I need a ring it down. Oh, well, we'll get to him in a minute. I like that one. Um, there was another quote as well from a chap called uh, Bo Bennett, who's an entrepreneur, author, motivational speaker. And he basically says, having a positive mental attitude is asking how something can be done rather than saying it can't be done. Pretty simple. Anyway, so moving forwards from that, um, something that I think is very, very important to all of this is, well, okay, you're all taking pictures of Willie Nelson. I'll mm -hmm. leave them up there. Um, but there's a reason that everything I've got is in the O. All of this starts on a foundation of observation. The power of observation, before simply being positive, actually allows you to validate your statements. If you simply go out there and you are spewing positivity, no one's gonna buy that. It's nice to hear, but if you've got some real athletes, no one's gonna buy that. Um, but if you sit back and you watch, whatever it is you're watching, if you sit back and watch for a minute, you can think about what you're seeing, you personally need to find a problem, yes, and find a solution. You don't necessarily need to tell the people you're working with what the problem is. Um, and then you can sit back and watch some more. I mean, you've got a clear problem that you want to fix. You think, right, what's the solution? I mean, I think we can all use our imagination here on a basic stroke and think of a solution to a problem. But I found that if you watch for another couple of minutes, you watch those players, they usually do the right thing somewhere in the course of those couple of minutes. 
They do the right thing and you can watch them do the right thing. And then when you bring them in and you talk to them, instead of saying, this is the solution, you can say, I have seen that when you do this, your shots are much better. And then instead of having to explain to them why it is they need to do a certain thing, you're actually saying you've already seen them do it. And the sale, if it needs to happen, in the sense of explaining to them why they need to do it, is so much easier. I've actually seen that when you bend your knees, you play better tennis. And then maybe they only did a tiny knee bend. Maybe the shot was only a little bit better. But you can tell them the good news is you already do it. We've just got to get you doing it more often and a little bit better. And honestly, that I've seen that work so many times, so well. And it comes from watching first, observing first. There is a thing called the self-determination theory. Sounds really fancy. Uh, I'd never heard of it until I started researching for this. It's essentially the power of motivation from within, with no external factors. Everyone's got their own level of self-determination. If you're interested in this stuff, look it up. It, um, there, it's got research after research after research. It's, it's a whole thing. But there is this one study, or actually a few, a few studies that test how people in position of authority, leaders, role models can affect your own self-determination. And these guys called Coker and Hager did a study on perceived autocratic behavior. And I like that word perceived because we may not think we're being autocratic, but if our behavior is being perceived as autocratic, Guess what, that's not a good thing. The effects were direct and negative on the people and their own personal determinational levels. Not only that, when teaching was positive with instructional, situational uh, consideration, so the teachers were more empathetic, the effects on people's personal levels of motivation were direct and positive. So when these people do these scientific studies, this is not just one or two people, when they give a result like this, it means that the statistics were heavily in the favor, otherwise they wouldn't have got put in print. A lot of this stuff comes from the journals of scientific research, various different ones are common. So it's like serious, this stuff, and it's, I find that stuff so powerful because We've heard so many times about the power of positivity, the power of this, that, and the other. And to have some real science backing it up really, I think, makes us, should make us sit back and think about how we're affecting the lives of the people that we're working with. So then there we go. Yeah, I live in Nashville. And <laughs> Willie Nelson said this. I stole this from, this is a t-shirt company, actually, and they post these really great things on Instagram. So we totally stole it off them and then off Willie Nelson. But I just think that that's the best way of putting it simply, you know. Um, so, there we go. The P of the communication code. What's next? Ah, adaptability. Okay, so I think that adaptability is... Okay, Emma, I should go back. I'll go this way. Okay. Um, <laughs> You need to be able to adapt your language depending on who you're talking to and how it is perceived. Again, that word perceived is really important because you don't know how it's being perceived if you're not observing people. But we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, you really don't want to get stuck in the same key phrases over and over again. The last thing you want to do is to become white noise. When I first got up here, the sound of this was driving me up the wall. <laughs> I was trying to think about what I was saying to you, and I was thinking, gosh, that thing's noisy. 
<laughs> buzzing away. And I'm not noticing it anymore. It's making the same buzz. It's become in the background. So, got a little story for you. I was coaching at a country club a couple of years ago, four, five, six years ago now. And I, I always listen to the coaches next door because I always think I'm going to pick up some tidbit from what they're saying. And uh, this, this one coach was, was coaching the backhand to these ladies and he kept saying, left hand low. I was thinking, I haven't heard that one before, what's going on over there? I was listening to him and his explanations and whatnot. And, you know, it's difficult when they're on the court, court next door, but I realized that it was his way of getting people to drop the racket head drop the left hand a little bit. And I thought, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to log that away as a different way of explaining the shape of the shot on the backhand side. Always like to say things. Personally, I'm always looking for different ways to say things. And then after a little while, I kept hearing left hand low <laughs> echoing across the courts. I didn't really think much of it because I had registered what it was and I'd moved on, I was looking for new tidbits. And then one day, I was sitting in the recreational area of the club, and I heard some ladies say, I don't know what he's talking about. He keeps saying left hand low, and I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and the coach had become so stuck in his ways of saying left hand low that he'd stopped explaining what it meant. I mean, in his defense, to him it made perfect sense, but to the ladies that were completely new to the court, they didn't and, and I think that's just a sign of something, maybe not to that extreme, but something that we all do, is we find our one key, drop the racket head, left hand low, whatever it is, we find our one key phrase, and we get stuck with it. So, ah, here we go. Right, um, I don't know what's next, let's see what's next here. Oh, we get a little bird watching. Does that make sense? Is that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you say, does that make sense? That, if you say it over and over again, you're not asking them anymore. You're actually trying to affirm your insecurity in what you know. You're trying, you're trying to actually, you're using, does that make sense? to see if you are making sense to yourself. Like you're trying to affirm yourself by saying that. Okay. If you say it over and over again, because what you're trying to get is affirmation for what you know as a coach, not does it do they understand. So you have to be, so, so what I hear is words are powerful. Yes. You need to know what you're saying. Yes. And you need to understand the repetition of what you say, familiarity breeds contempt. Well, I would think too, if, you, if you're saying something as basic as left hand low, and the person's not doing it, then you need to figure out a different way to say it, because clearly, mm -hmm. it's like, they don't get it. If they're not doing it, they don't get it. Assuming they're able to do it, so you have to figure out a different way to say it. Choose more than one way to Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and that's what I was about to get into again. 
said <laughs> is that saying things, letting people try to do what it is you've asked, and then watching them for a minute and seeing how it's interpreted. Actually, so what I was going to try to do with this thing, which is going to be really interesting, is do something a little bit weird and actually open it up to the floor to talk about different ways to phrase a repair. So we're going to see what I can come up with here. Um, but I was going to just try to hit a forehand really weirdly and not focus on the problem, focus on different solutions. Okay, so we'll see what I can come up with here. It's going to be a little interesting. I haven't used one of these in a lot. Of them. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. So I can do any, be an example of anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want to? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're, we're looking for solutions here, coaches. Okay. Hit, hit a forehand. You're holding the racket wrong. Tell me right away, Lori. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do a forehand, right? Okay. Ooh, Don't break my racket. Huh? <laughs> Don't break my racket. No. I've never touched it. Is that true? Just good? Yeah, I mean, just have fun. Oh, great. No, I don't want to bother Okay. All right, so first of all, stop, 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 before you go any further. Take your time. Okay. Watch the ball when you're hitting it, because you're not hitting the ball, you're hitting the machine. See? I don't want you to break your racket, I don't want you to break my eye, coach. <laughs> Half speed. <laughs> Don't bring it. Anyone have anything else they want to throw out on that? Okay. Thank you. Do you need to lose particular just 
No. <laughs> it's always good to have company up here. Thank you. And I think, you know, just a couple of chips. So. <laughs> <laughs> so another way that we can be really adaptable is using analogies, and I love analogies. Um, so an analogy is just simply, it helps people to build a bridge between what they, they already know, something that's familiar, and something that's new. And I'm going to tell you a little story, one of my favorite, really weird analogies. Um, oh, well, you know, I haven't done the exercise yet today. So, I had this lady, and if this is the ball she's hitting, she was basically hitting everything here. Everything, you know? And, and it didn't matter what I said, you know, I need you to start, as the ball's coming over the net, I need you to prepare earlier, I need, I was doing all of the things we just did. Hmm. And I was, I was running out. I didn't know what to do. And it was November. And I said to her, you got family coming over for Thanksgiving. Hmm. And this was really fun because she went, where? And this is why at the very beginning I have to say, please stop me if you think I've gone crazy because this is the kind of thing I do. I said, have you got family coming over for Thanksgiving? Yes. So, okay, how long does it take to cook a turkey? Four hours, I think, right? Maybe? Okay. I think it's like a long time. Four hours, okay. Um, when your family arrives, they arrive at like what time? Like four o'clock, and we usually eat at six. I'm like, okay, so, and you've got to lay the table, and you've got to do the grocery shop. Yeah, so they're going to arrive at six. When do you put the turkey in? You know, at, at noon? At, at two? When, when, when do you do the grocery shopping? Oh, I actually already did that. Really? Because you know it's Thanksgiving next week. You're doing the grocery shopping now. So if you know this ball is a forehand, why on earth are you waiting for it to bounce before you prepare for it? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, Oh my gosh, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, great, so can you please start, start this like, now? And she was like, yeah, totally. I don't want my guests to have raw turkeys. I don't want you hitting bad forehand. So, yeah, that, that gets through to people, I found. And um, there was a study done in 1989 by a chap called Glyn. And his buddies. And um, he found that only 75. Oh, you did go to sleep. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Can we see what's next? It might be relevant. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Escalator. 
right, the ancient Greeks really knew what they were doing. And this is called the Socratic method. And it's from Socrates, see? And his method, one of his main methods, was to ask a lot of questions. And he had method behind his questions. And these questions, these are sort of some of the, the main points to his questions. So for example, clarify is a little bit like what I just gave an example of, simply asking why. And talking about, sorry, I'm going away, talking about the why. Challenging questions by saying, or, or something by saying, is this always the case? And having a discussion around that. Giving evidence, so to say, is there reason to doubt this? Again, that's a little bit of a why question. Alternative viewpoints, obviously, is a really good one because when you start looking at things from different perspectives, you see different things. The consequences, of course, is quite useful in tennis because you can start to ask what will happen when things happen which of course, when it comes to the sequence events, a little bit like earlier, we got to the root of the problem, which was the spacing and the preparation. All the other stuff went wrong because of that. Um, and of course, question the question. When you go down and you say to some child, or someone that you're coaching, when you ask them these questions, if you, if you can question why that's important, you will have a far greater understanding of what's going on. So some of these are a little less relevant for us as tennis coaches directly on the court, but I put them all up there because I think it's really good for us to examine the way we talk to people and the way we ask these questions and just to think about the reasoning behind our questions. Sometimes it can seem like a little bit of an argument, especially in Today's day and age, you do have to be careful about how you phrase things, but to have a little bit of an argumentative dialogue is not always a bad thing. We are learning from each other, just as I encouraged you all to ask me questions at the beginning. It's the same thing with your players. Not forgetting the great big circle that's around all of this. The best questions will come from having watched something first. They will, you will be able to think about what you're asking and why you're asking it far more effectively if you sit back and watch for a minute. Am I on a tight deadline? No. All right, just checking. Five minutes or so. That is a tight deadline. Five. five. Right on the hour. <laughs> you're giving me five minutes extra. Over here. All right, so I'll tell this story. Um, <laughs> It's a good one. Um, this, this chap I was coaching, he's sort of a 15-year-old, um, up-and-coming junior, and he comes back to me from a tournament one day, and he says, Coach Margaret, I was so unwell. I was on ibuprofen, hopefully not to the point of liver failure where I was wearing <laughs> <laughs>
in itself is really important. That was a failure. Mm -hmm. I, I tried, I was really hoping that he was going to come back and say, I thought about, I mean, I, was, I didn't want to tell him what I thought the answer was, because I wanted him to come back with something maybe original. <coughs> I, was, I was hoping he would come up with the conclusion that maybe being relaxed and having no pressure because he thought he was sick helped him play more freely. We, we never got to that conclusion at all because he tried Google instead. <laughs> so so you know, there, are, there are times when it's, it's worth maybe setting some parameters because I think thinking about things can be really key. And unfortunately, Google didn't provide the answer in this case. Hmm. Um, oh, OK. There's, has, has anyone read The Talent Code? Yes, yes, yes. OK, so you will have heard this before. Um, but I'm going to remind you because I think this is huge. There is a point in this book, which if you haven't read it, please do. For coaches, it is a fantastic book, The Talent Code. Um, and this, this book has a small section in it that lists two lists of words. The list on one side has most of the words spelt incorrectly. And on the other side, they are spelt correctly. And the instructions are, please read these lists. It was just random words, you know, Porsche, potato, banana, jeep, whatever. Um, and it asked you to memorize, but not for very long, just two minutes on this one, two minutes on that one, whatever. Flip the page, and it says, how many do you remember from both lists? The list that had the words spelt incorrectly, everyone remembers because your brain goes back over that list of words over and over and it goes, that's a problem, I must solve it. What does that say? How's that spelled? That's not how you spell banana. Oh, it's a banana. Anyway, so the process of going through those words up here means that they stick. So by asking questions and getting us to think about something in just a little bit more detail actually means that you're more likely to learn we go back to what I said at the beginning, we do it in a positive way and we've activated that piece of the brain that actually improves learning and memory retention, we're having even more effect on these kids. And that's just by the way that we talk. Isn't that, that makes me feel cool. I like that feeling. I like that, I like the feeling that I can do that. Um, okay. This author wrote, that quote, and I liked it. Because at the end of the day, by questioning people, we are being more submissive. We are not being autocratic. And if you remember earlier, I mentioned that autocratic teachers had a negative effect on their students. So submissiveness actually can be a really useful thing to add in to our methods of communication. So I talked about Socrates earlier, and he was actually very famous for saying that he was ignorant. Others around him claimed to be very knowledgeable, but he believed that his awareness of his ignorance made him wise when those around him actually were not. This doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But by believing he was ignorant, he went back and questioned his own knowledge and actually learned more. Those of us, especially me about 15 years ago, who think we know it all, stop because we know it all. And therefore we cannot learn anymore. And it's only by believing that there is so much more to be learned that we will actually learn more. So we all deal with very different groups of people and people who learn and understand in very different ways. And one of the beauties for me about tennis coaching is that moment when suddenly you see that someone has actually made, they've had an aha moment, or they've really made some progress based on what I've done with them, my work. It's exciting and it's humbling all at the same time. And it's very easy for us, I think, to sometimes think, this person's not 
not improving, they're just not athletic, they're just not something, they're just not something, pass the blame to whoever it is. And I believe that no matter who it is, it's our responsibility to get that person to love our sport and to succeed to the best of our ability. We can help anyone to improve if we really put our mind to it. And it's really this problem solving process that I find so fun about coaching. I really do. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. And obviously, I'd love for you to remember four words. Positive, adaptable, communication, always with a basis in observation. So, if anyone's got any questions, we've got about 